Okay, so last but not the least session. So we have some exciting talks in this session. So uh, the first one uh, is Ujwal. So uh, he's going to talk about uh, human-centered artificial intelligence, uh, a crowd computing perspective. So Ujwal is a tenured faculty at the Delft uh, Technical, Technical University. 
and uh, like he has a lot of accolades uh, the acm distinguished speaker uh, so and he works uh, at the intersection of hci and ai uh, and uh, today he's going to, I think the talk is also going to be around that. So I myself uh, am very interested in uh, these uh, topics these days, especially the fairness related issues uh, coming up uh, in AI cross uh, HCI. And I am looking forward to his talk. Over to Jill. Give him at least the hand mic or the color mic. It's not so easy to speak from here. Is this on already? Yeah, it's on. Check, check. And you can put it in the screen. Also. Just try once. Am I audible? Can you all hear me? No, I guess it's. Oh yeah. Okay. I'm get. Uh, so for the folks at the back, can you all hear me? Yes. All right. Awesome. Hello. Good morning, everyone. I'm between you and your lunch, so I'll try and make this as exciting as I possibly can. I'm really pleased to be here. I'd like to thank all the organizers for having me. Um, and yeah, let's see what exactly we can talk about over the next forty minutes or so. It is indeed in the space of human-centered artificial intelligence. And I think a lot of us here who've gathered in this amazing event have spoken about the importance of this area in general over the last two or three days, right? And I'm going to touch upon some of those interesting aspects as well while trying to present a few interesting uh, ideas and thoughts along the lines of how we can build better AI systems. So to get started, first up, I think I don't need to convey how important this area actually is, right? All of us from dawn to dusk are witnessing a lot of AI systems that we're interacting with. Advances in machine learning and AI have spurred up a bunch of revolutions across all kinds of domains, right? You think about your transportation domain, we've seen advances with the likes of drones and air taxis that are quite useful in a number of different contexts. We've seen how traffic congestions can be easily resolved and Passengers are often being given all kinds of amazing services as a result of advances in computer vision and machine learning and so forth. Right? If you think about the domain of health, well, we've seen through the course of a bunch of ta uh, talks earlier on in the last couple of days how there are a number of applications that can really push the envelope towards progress in general. Right? And much can be said about the finance, education, manufacturing, you name it. However, if you were to look at this, through a historical lens, right? And if you think about the last couple of centuries that we as a human species have been a part of in terms of witnessing remarkable technical advances, there are lots of interesting lessons that can be learned through that historical lens, right? One being the fact that there are high costs that are often concomitant with great technological advances, right? What does that mean? Well, can someone here give me a quick answer around what was one of the biggest things that came through in the energy sector, which sort of revolutionized what exactly we could do henceforth? Any quick ideas about what happened in the energy sector? Oil, yes. But in terms of uh, trying to come up with a technological advancement, I think the steam engine is one that's quite unparalleled, right? And quickly following the steam engine, we had this advancement coming up with, oh, uh, energy turbines, right? Or, and then you had the internal combustion engine, you had things like the turboprop engines, and then you had the jet engine. And all of this meant that it improved an, the energy sector and what was actually possible, right? Much like that, if you think about industrial agriculture, what it led to was a sharp increase in the production of food. This was concomitant with a decline in infectious diseases, which then meant there could be a sharp rise in life expectancies. But all of these advances came hand in hand with a number of costs. And these costs often are also crippling, right? None more so than climate change. At the same time, you also had negative impacts of industrial agriculture, 
you had an increase in the extinction rate of species, right? There's also a dwindling biodiversity on the planet as we stand and talk about these things today, right? So as much as there are advances, there are lots of costs that go hand in hand with them quite often. And right now we're amidst of a number of wars that are taking place around the globe. And we've seen how technology can aid those outcomes as well, right? And if you look at the numbers over the last decade or the last century even, the number of casualties and wars have been sharply increasing, right? And perhaps technology has a large amount of blame to take for all of that. Now, I would argue that AI and advances in AI are no different, right? One of the reasons why I'd like to use the analogy of a double-edged sword over here is because of the fact that we need to be extremely responsible as we build new technologies that can help potentially aid humans and tasks that they're interested in, and tasks that they're accomplishing already, but would rather get augmentation from technology, right? So history bears many lessons for what could potentially happen if we don't get this right. And that's something I'd like to speak a little bit about as we go ahead in this talk. Now, this is an image from a satellite that was captured not too long ago. In fact, it broke into a very big news story in Europe, in France in particular, have any of you here seen this and do you know the story that I'm alluding to? In fact, a couple of days ago, when we had uh, Ms. Brahma talk about the economics and the econometrics and machine learning fields, she spoke, uh, there was a question from the audience about whether or not we can use AI to try and catch tax evaders, right? And this is precisely what happened in France a few months ago. So there was a bit of AI tech Nothing staggering, right? Not quite the chat GPT that's been, you know, the, the topic of conversation in many circles the last couple of weeks. But it was very simple computer vision algorithm that could be used to try and detect swimming pools in the, back, in the backyards of residential areas, right? And it turns out there are a lot of people who like to keep this fact hidden from the government, the fact that they have a pretty fancy pool sitting in the background of their residential homes, right? And turns out this piece of software was capable of identifying those and flagging them. And then the French government managed to identify and pull out up to $10 million in taxes. And this was now being transferred into a nationwide campaign, right? So arguably a good application of AI, if you're thinking about it from the perspective of democracy and how you need to be a honorable citizen, right? Now, moving further, how many of you have seen this in mainstream news? I see a few hands going up. Yeah, you have. Exactly. So for those of you who are uninitiated, got a little bit of a video here. Oh, wait, doesn't seem to work, but I'll give you the full story anyway. So as it turns out, this is, uh... oh. all right. If you can click that for me, I'd appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah, so as it turns out, this is one of the Teslas on an expressway. And the autopilot recognizes the setting sun and mistakes it to be a traffic light, right? So what you'll observe is that the autopilot detects this to be a, a traffic light that's asking it to slow down and the car starts slowing down, right? One of the many undesirable consequences that we've witnessed over the last couple of years or so, ever since you know, the advances in uh, AI and technology as we know of it. Now, I don't have to tell you how dangerous this is. If you're familiar with the notion of the German Autobahn, where you'll find that there are quite a few roads where you don't really have to slow down, that could be extremely dangerous, right? Imagine your car slowing down in la lanes where the speed limit is 160 or 200 miles an hour, right? Pretty insane. Uh, thank you, that's all right. Uh, and now this is an example I'd like to share out of my own personal experience, right? A few months ago, there's probably a deadline, right? That's when we sleep less. I had this week where I was sleeping pretty, well, terribly. I don't recommend this if you're a PhD student. So I was probably getting about five hours of sleep during that week. And then the weekend, I tried to make up for it, right? So I slept for about seven hours. And then Garmin, which is this, you know, to, uh, a Garmin watch is what I'm wearing right now, and I like to track some of the health vitals, much like perhaps some of you here like to do, right? What happened, though, was 
this piece of intelligent insight that Garmin was giving me actually read as follows. I don't know if this is actually legible, but it says your average night of sleep during the week is five hours, while you get an average of seven hours on the weekends. So you're clearly doing something wrong on the weekends. Working toward a consistent sleep schedule, even through the weekends, can improve your overall wellness. Right? So what it's essentially telling me to do is you're doing it right during the week, you're doing it wrong during the weekends. Why aren't you sleeping only for five hours? Sleep for five hours over the weekend, right? So clearly there's some leap in interpretation uh, of the underlying algorithm over here, right? Now, luckily I'm not stupid, so I'm not following that advice, but you never know, right? Now, that essentially paints this picture of a number of growing concerns in AI systems and how AI systems are being used, right? And the machine learning algorithms that are potentially powering all of these. And it's partially due to these kinds of narratives that we also observe a massive divide in you know, general purpose communication about all of this, right? We've obviously seen a lot of these headlines in newspapers and tabloids and you have it, right? Quite often, many of these are grossly exaggerated Will a robot steal your job? Yeah, sure. Will computers begin taking over the world? Yes, of course they will, right? And these are grossly exaggerated, scientifically unsound quite often, and sometimes also just you know clickbait like headlines that try to capture your imagination. So if I was to think about this, I think the AI narrative is a seesaw of extremes, right? And this is in part thanks to the narrative that's being fed to us through pop culture resources. On the one hand, they're posed as being AI dreams, where they're often talking about startling advances and how exactly this can change the world we live in. But the other side of the narrative, the other extreme, is that which is painted with the, on the canvas of AI nightmares, right? The fact that there might be terrifying possibilities of machines taking over the world, of us becoming enslaved by a machine that apparently is better. And this is being aided by the books we read, the games we play, the movies we watch. They reinforce this sort of an understanding. Could there be a third perspective at this juncture, right? On the one hand, you have these AI dreams. On the other hand, you have the AI nightmares. Is there a third perspective? Well, it turns out there actually is. And it's this compelling prospect of human-centered AI, where the notion of building new technology and advancing how we use AI systems in our everyday lives is meant to amplify the human ability Right? It's not meant to allow you to do things that you don't do anyway or that you're not interested in. So it's not tech for the sake of tech, right? But the notion of building AI systems that can actually amplify human capabilities, that can augment and enhance our experiences, is the broad umbrella of what you can conceive as being human-centered AI. Right? And there's a book by a pioneer in the field, Ben Schneiderman, who spoke a fair bit about this, and I totally recommend having a look at this if this rocks your boat. Now, present-day AI systems, though, are far away from these ideals, right? So this human-centered AI, the notion of trying to build AI systems that can amplify our experiences and help augment our lives, present-day AI systems fall short of being just that, right? And the problems that exist in these systems, for a large part, are due to how these systems are engineered, but also because of how humans tend to interact with these systems. So there are problems that two folds, one with how they're built and the other with how people tend to interact with them. And it's exactly at this juncture that I like to position my work and the work I'm gonna to speak to you about over the next half an hour or so. And I like to think of it as the human caution for better AI systems. What exactly can humans do to help build better AI systems, right? And I like to think of this from two different perspectives that I'll dive into. And as I said, this works position in human-centered AI and crowd computing. This has to do with how you can understand how humans interact with AI systems, so human-AI interaction. How can you bring humans in the loop to try and improve interactions, right? And to a large extent, a lot of this is about the computational role that humans can potentially play. You can think of this as AI that's being supported by human input or AI being supported by humans. On the other hand, you have the interactional role that humans can play, right? At the end of the day, you're building all of these machines and systems so they can help real humans, right? So just by observing how humans tend to interact with AI systems, you could potentially gain a lot of deep insight 
into how you can build better AI systems. So this is the interactional role that humans can still play in help pushing the envelope towards better AI systems. And I think at this juncture, there's a pretty important and prominent role that conversational in interfaces can play. And that's something that I'm quite interested in as well. And I'll try and paint a few ideas towards how exactly that can all come together. First up, let's try and dive a little deeper into the computational role that humans can play. Now, through the course of a bunch of ta uh, talks that we've witnessed over the last two days, we've seen how people have alluded to this zeal of research communities to get to this point where you can build more intelligence in a machine, right? And if you think about this from the grand vantage point of artificial general intelligence, this you know, proverbial mirage that people have been running after for time immemorial, people have across different research communities have always wanted to build machines that are more like human, right? More like humans rather. And I'm personally not one of those people. I don't think we need to make machines that are sentient by any means at all. But I do think there is a bit of a, there is a fair bit to gain by making them a little more intelligent, right? By allowing for seamless interactions between humans with AI systems across the board. And it's been that prospect that I see there's a great value in one of the computational roles that humans can play. Allow me to break that down for you. So think about the space of conversational AI, right? And conversational user interfaces. All of us here have probably been exposed to interactions with smart digital assistants like your Alexas or Siri's or Cortana's, or if you haven't interacted with one directly, you've most certainly been exposed to that modality, right? What's consistent across the board with all of these interactions is the fact that there are conversational breakdowns, right? And one of the reasons, not the only, but one of the primary reasons is the fact that machines are just not capable of reasoning over common sense knowledge like we humans are, right? If I was to get off stage and run and bump into one of you, I could bet my bottom dollar that it would annoy you, right? Or if I was to walk out and it starts pouring, I know through my common sense knowledge that I would probably get wet, and this concept called wet could potentially lead to this concept called sickness, right? And this concept called sickness could probably last for a few days, for a month, for a year, right? But these are things that we gain through our experience, through our everyday life. It's common sense knowledge that you're leveraging to function in a seamless fashion in your everyday situations, right? But we're not quite there with machines because of the fact that there's no real common sense knowledge that they can tap into and reason over, much like they do over structured knowledge bases, which is why you see that the when it comes to factual queries with conversational assistance, they're quite good. But when it comes to having a longer, deeper conversation about other things, it's far more challenging, right? Because intent recognition becomes so much more harder there. The amount of sparse sparsity in that space is just far greater. So this is essentially one of the areas that we try to dive into and see how you can use human intelligence to harness such common sense knowledge which is rather important in uh, pushing the envelope further towards better AI systems, helping them to reason over common sense knowledge, right? Uh, the talk before me was a good example of how you could, you know, try and build neurosymbolic AI systems by learning from how humans tend to reason with one another, right? And how humans function in general, how human cognition actually works. And there's a lot of merit in pursuing this because of the fact that it also allows us to debug machine learning models that we're building these days, right? But existing knowledge elicitation methods are quite limited. They don't allow you to elegantly elicit common sense knowledge that is beyond descriptive, right? Telling me that a bottle has a bottle cap is probably not the smartest piece of knowledge that will allow me to propel progress in these uh, situations or contexts, right? but maybe something that's more difficult, more difficult to articulate, but recites at the fag ends of our minds and our imagination, right? That's the deep tacit knowledge, which is harder to articulate, but exists at the back of our heads, right? If I was to keep pushing you towards that, you would probably reveal more and more of the common sense knowledge you actually have, which, is, which makes it quite challenging, right? How can I gather all the common sense knowledge that exists in this room, in this auditorium over here, and represent it in a nice structured fashion that can you know, help me in downstream AI tasks. Difficult problem. Not for too long though. We came up with this game with a purpose called Find It Out that allows us to do exactly that, right? It allows us to gather broad, tacit, negative, and discriminative knowledge. So negative knowledge has been shown to be quite useful in a lot of reasoning uh, setups, 
discriminative knowledge is knowledge that tells you how one entity is different from another and how exactly and what you know what are the different attributes that allow you to say an apple's different from an uh, from a banana right and how oranges are different from other fruits or whatever it is on under the planet so let's see what exactly find it out is now find it out is a configurable game that you can use to elicit such diverse knowledge right well if some of you have played guess who then you'd probably be familiar with the game mechanics that govern this game it's a two-player game which you can try out it uh, functions lots of fun do give it a shot uh, how the game works is at the onset you have two players who receive exactly the same game board right so you have a bunch of entity cards that are present on your game board and each of the players has a different card that's assigned to them as being their main card. Now, the objective for both players is to try and guess the other person's card. Whoever does that faster wins the game. And to progress, they can ask each other questions and respond to them truthfully, right? How does it work? We have a bunch of relational templates, again, configurable, depending on the context you want to create common sense knowledge around. And one of the players uh, is assigned the role of an asker when the game begins. The other one's assigned the role of a replier. And these uh, roles are exchanged at the end of every turn, right? So the asker, as an example over here, is asking the other player, is your card a carnivore, right? And this relation is something that they can use, but then there's this open-ended string that they can use to ask whatever they want using their common sense knowledge, right? So here the player asks, is your card a carnivore? And the point of asking this is to try and eliminate a few of the cards that probably don't fit this proposition, right? And the replier then gets to respond with a yes, no, or a maybe if, there's not, if they're not sure. Or if the question itself was quite unclear and you'd like the asker to reformulate it, you could hit the unclear button. Now, what happens next is the replier uh, or the asker rather gets to eliminate a few of the cards from the contention, right? Now that I know this is a, a carnivore or this isn't a carnivore, I can eliminate some of the cards that are potentially in contention. Now, as a result of all of this, some of the collected knowledge that you can gain through that single turn is positive knowledge, like an otter is a carnivore, right? We saw an example again in the last talk about a, a cat being a carnivore and how that could be useful in uh, reasoning, right? And then you, from that single turn, you have the fact that a hare is a carnivore, uh, is not a carnivore rather. And then by combining these two tuples of knowledge, you also have this discriminative tuple that tells you how exactly an otter and a hare are different from one another, right? And as the game progresses and the levels get deeper, the nature or the tacitness of the knowledge also increases. You can imagine how, you know, once there are only two cards that are left on the table, they're probably quite similar to one another and you now are trying to come up with the most distinguishing unique factor and therefore you tap into the, you know, deeper imagination that you have that resides in what we can conceive as being tacit common sense knowledge, right? Let me give you a few examples. So we ran a bunch of empirical studies using existing uh, data sets that have to do with downstream AI tasks, because what's the grand agenda? It's not just to gather common sense knowledge. It's also to see how knowledge can actually be used in downstream AI tasks, right? So one part of it is to make sure you, you do have means to elicit tacit common sense knowledge, but that's only half the story. You also want to see whether you can use that in downstream AI tasks. Right? So if I can draw your attention to the first game board here on your screens, this had entities of the likes of a floor, a window, a bathroom, walls, a chandelier, so on and so forth. Right? Through gameplay and through these interactions that I just demonstrated, we found that one of the tacit tuples of knowledge that was elicited was the fact that a chandelier can also be used as a decorative item. Right? It's probably not something that you'd think about right away off the bat, something that you could consider uh, as being tacit and much like that in another game board we found that when you're talking about boots one of the common sense knowledge tuples that emerged was that boots can be associated with cowboys right if i was to ask you all about boots you'd probably first start telling me about how boots are can be made of different materials how they can have bigger or smaller heels how they could be leather how they could be anything else in the world and then you'd probably think about oh cowboys can be associated with wearing boots as well, right? And another example that emerged from that. So to give you a few insights into what we found, we had we recruited a 125 players who played over a couple of thousand rounds of this game. 
which resulted in a fair amount of knowledge tuples. And then we also realized that the throughput of our game in terms of how quickly we could create or generate a fair bit of knowledge was far more efficient in comparison to a reference baseline that we had, right? And then we also looked at some of the downstream AI tasks. We looked at common sense question answering. We looked at identification of discriminative attributes. And we found that using this common sense knowledge without doing anything fancy, just plugging it into existing state-of-the-art models helped improve the accuracy further, right? What's more important or equally important is that people who are playing this game also enjoyed the experience because with games with a purpose, the objective often is to reap rewards as a byproduct, right? So everyone who's playing the game is probably doing it also because they're having fun. And the more fun they have and the better you know, game you can facilitate, the nicer the byproduct, right? We can dive into that later if you have any questions. All right, that's one example of how you can use humans in a computational role, right? Over here, you're using humans to generate common sense knowledge, which you can use to improve how your AI systems function. I'd also like to dive into this little intersection of HCI and AI, as Animesh was saying, uh, intersection that I quite enjoy working on, and that's the explainable AI space, right? Now, many of us here are probably familiar with explanation methods like lines and shaps, right? They're often single shot explanation methods where you sort of come up with an explanation in you know, computer vision tasks. It's often using the likes of uh, saliency maps or heat maps, right? And the more, the hotter a region is, the more it is indicative of being responsible for a particular classification. So what exactly is being classified here? What's, so this is a scene recognition task. And what do you think the scene is? Any guesses? A kitchen, yes, absolutely. So this, this picture has been correctly classified as being a kitchen, right? And now you can use human intelligence to try and attribute concept level explanations to this explanation, right? So you can use humans in the loop to say, hey, what exactly is being identified as an important or salient aspect of this image being identified as a kitchen? And turns out with simple uh, workflows, you can, you can come up with concepts that can be you know, attributed to bounding boxes, right? So now we know that the reason why this is being classified as a kitchen is largely due to the ceiling that's been identified and due to the chair. Any issues with this? Obviously, yes, right? The, the fact that kitchens can come in all kinds of shapes and sizes and the fact that you have ceilings and chairs and pretty much many scenes that you can imagine would make it a very brittle, uh, you know, classification. Right? This is something that could potentially be an unknown unknown where your machine learning model probably has a high confidence on this classification, but it's still error prone. Right? And these are the most difficult uh, errors to catch and mitigate. Right? But if I could reconstruct with the same image and using an exactly similar workflow of what the actual average human understanding of this particular scene is and should be, I could then pit it against what we have with respect to the machine understanding and try and identify what the blind spots are, right? So we're here, we see that a countertop or an oven or a microwave or a refrigerator are far more representative of what a kitchen should be uh, or what a kitchen is, right? As compared to a ceiling or the chair that was identified. So that's again, a nice way of using humans in the loop to try and identify blind spots in machine learning models or computer vision model in this case. So this is just a depiction of how we orchestrated a workflow where we could identify the, or uh, help collect these concept level explanations. I won't dive too deep into that. Here's another piece of work, which I'd like to really touch upon. This is under review, so I can't really tell you the full spiel there, but we came up with a annotation interface, which we call perspective. Again, with this goal of trying to identify model blind spots, right? The fact that a lot of blind spots that are learned by machine learning models often tend to be an artifact of the data set of, or the underlying data that is fed, but also leads to these unknown unknowns, right? So you know, it's quite easy to understand or identify and mitigate errors that you're aware of, but quite often there are errors that you're not aware of, right? You can't do anything about ones you're not aware of. And that's essentially the category of unknown unknowns. But you can try and identify these by using clever strategies and human intelligence. So look at the 
image that's being presented on the left hand sides of your screens, right? This one's supposed to be an image that's classified as being a cross saw, right? And perhaps correctly so because of the fact that you can see a cross saw over here, right? But then because I know that the patterns that are being learned are often an artifact of the underlying data set, I want to see how typical this particular image is of croissants in that data set, right? Then what I could do is look at visually similar images or look at some of the random samples from that class of croissants and see whether or not this particular image is actually typical within this data set or is it atypical, right? Now, the merit in trying to characterize the typicality of an image is in understanding how representative this is of that concept, right? And using a workflow like this, you can actually build a nice repository of, a, of human understandings of concepts, right? And, and it's quite easy to do this from the machine perspective. And then, you know, you probably get where I'm going, right? Understanding the atypicality of concepts around us will allow us to also understand where the blind spots potentially lie, right? So that's, uh, that's an example. For example, uh, over here, yeah, you can basically do this for all kinds of things, right? Over here on the right-hand side, you see a class, a, a bunch of different classes. So if, if you take that image of a croissant and on the right-hand, uh, on the middle, you have a random sample of images from croissants and on the right-hand side, you have visually similar images, right? So now you can clearly tell that, hey, because of the fact that there's a croissant like this, it's quite easy to confuse it with a with the class of chefs or smiles and thanksgivings because it's exactly that sort of a composition in that image, right? So it helps you to understand more about your underlying data. Great. That's nice and dandy as well. You told me how I can use humans in computational roles, but what about this in interactional role that you're talking about, right? Thanks for asking. Let me tell you what exactly we can do there. So crowd computing, as I've been trying to hint, is a necessary and important means to try and advance the next generation of AI systems, right? Because right now we have a lot of AI systems that are quite advanced thanks to a number of different reasons. But I think, you know, the big magic sauce that can help push the bar further is in trying to tap into human intelligence and feeding it through um, and trying and propelling advances in these interactional perspectives as well. Now, with crowd computing, we can orchestrate large-scale uh, human-centered experiments. We can run all kinds of randomized control trials. We saw merits of those seeping through in the talk that we had a couple of days ago from uh, Ms. Brahma, where she spoke about the importance of looking at econometrics and randomized controlled trials and so forth. I'll walk you through a few examples to paint that picture cleaner, right? And this is a piece of work we did a couple of years ago with behavioral economists in Göttingen University back in Germany. And uh, we used one of their behavioral economics frameworks, that of a ultimatum bargaining game. Right. For those of you who are not familiar with this, the way the game works is you have two players. You have the proposer, and this is the simplest single shot ultimatum bargaining game where you only have a single uh, interaction. Right? Let's imagine Animesh being the gentleman he is, says, you know what, I have, I have 20,000 rupees that I'm placing here on the table. Now, Ujwal, you can take this 20,000 rupees and offer a share to Niloy, right? And let's imagine I'm the proposer and I have that 20,000 rupees on the table, which is an endowment. Right now, I can say, hey, you know what, Niloy, uh, you're such an amazing person and you know such a pioneer in our field, and I respect you a lot. So I'll give you maybe five thousand. Right? I'm a greedy man, and I want to keep. 50. And Niloy might say, you know what, five five k out of twenty, that's mean. I'm not going to accept it. I'll reject this. Right now, if Niloy rejects the proposal, both of us get nothing. Right? But if I was to make a fair bargain and say, you know what, let me give you half of it, it's probably going to say, yeah, okay, that's fair. I'll keep half of it, right? And as long as the bargain is struck, we both get the proportion that we're bargaining for. If it's rejected by the responder, we get nothing, right? That's essentially the framework. Now, why is that interesting or even relevant here? Now, it's quite important to understand how dependence on decision support systems actually affect people in that neighborhood, right? Uh, one of the places we're observing a strong and increasing use of AI systems and advice is in decision support scenes, right? Where you're making some decisions, you're not quite sure what right one, then you can ask AI systems, which are far more powerful in processing historical data and giving you some amount of advice, right? And why is that important? It's important because this can allow you to, uh, trying to understand this systematically, can allow you to see how people who are directly interacting with AI systems would uh, perceive fairness of such interactions, right? Imagine I'm 
what we did essentially over here, and this will make that a little clearer, is we recruited a bunch of participants, asked them to play these roles of being proposers and responders while giving them certain endowments, uh, monetary endowments, right? Said, hey, try and make this transaction. If you, if you manage to you know, make, strike a deal, you'll keep it. Otherwise, you'll you know, both get nothing, right? And we ran several hundreds of these human-human interactions. We gathered all of these human-human interactions and trained a very simple uh, model to act as a means of providing some advice in the next iteration, right? So now the proposer could use the aid of this decision support system that would tell them what is a likely bargain that would be accepted? What's the likely offer that would get accepted, right? And now by introducing that decision support system, what exactly is gonna to happen to the responders? Would the responders now, you know, like they're being cut short? Those are the sort of dynamics that we wanted to study, right? How do people who are directly using the system behave? How are people who are indirectly affected by the system behave, right? And one of the reasons we use such a behavioral economics framework is because it's because of the simplicity and clean framework that it is, it allows you to draw inferences across domains that are similar in context, right? So what we found, uh, to keep a long story short, is that the perceptions of fairness changed when you introduced these decisions. What was previously construed as being fair was sometimes now being construed as being unfair because there was a decision support system that was being presented to the proposer. What we also found in a consequent uh, experiment was when we explained what the system was doing, then more transactions were actually being successfully reached, right? So this increased the cooperation amongst humans once they truly understood what the system was doing, right? To go a little further, we also looked at the fact that AI systems are being adopted left, right, and center these days, right? So we've seen a huge spike in how AI systems are being used to make hiring decisions, to try and understand what exactly credit loan decisions should be made like. We've also seen algorithmic pricing being a very wide application, right? So in contexts where there is the scope of bargaining and negoci negotiating, there's a growing use of AI, right? But quite often, all of these, the many promises of AI, as I like to call it, are based on a couple of fundamental assumptions, right? And these benefits can, actually get manifested if these conditions are met. What are these? One, the first condition is that people actually do end up interacting with the AI. Imagine I build an extremely accurate machine learning model, right? Package it into this AI system that people can now use to complete tasks or transactions that they're typically interested in. But what if I don't trust the system at all? What if there's a fancy little system sitting here ready to help me out, but I'm not interested in interacting with it, right? So the and that's one of the important conditions that's often swept under the rug, right? Where a large number of us are quite focused on improving the accuracy of these systems. And there's merit in that, don't get me wrong, but that's only half the picture. The other half is about how do humans end up interacting with these systems? What good is an amazing system that no one interacts with, right? Uh, and the other condition before I move forward is that these AI systems do not systematically err when they're trying to predict human choices, right? Because if there is some systematic bias or a systematic error, then these benefits won't really construe as being uh, as, uh, to reach the potential they probably have. Now, uh, we had a paper recently at CHI where we explored this in a systematic fashion, where now that you're familiar with the ultimatum bargaining game, I'll just give you a quick run over what we did there. So you, you know how there are transactions that need to be struck between a responder and a proposer, or a proposer and a responder. What we did now was we said, let the pr proposer choose the nature of responder they wanna make a bargain with, right? And we said the responder can be another human or the responder can be a human who's being assisted by an AI system or an autonomous system that's representing the responder, right? And let's try and understand how people tend to make these decisions. Let's try and understand how people systematically tend to uh, understand their economic self-interest, right? Long story short, we also had a very nice way of articulating what was their economic self-interest, right? So each of the participants knew that there was a certain amount of benefit to be gained by interacting with a human who had a decision support system, <laughs> excuse me, or a human who was interacting with an autonomous system, right? What did we find? Well, we found that humans tend to overwrite their economic self-interest only with the objective to try and avoid interacting with AI systems, right? 
So again, case in point, just building a great system is not enough. You also probably need to uh, build mechanisms that help people interact with systems so they can gain the benefits they potentially can, right? Great, so it's this golden age of AI that I'm trying to reflect on here, right? And this golden age of AI, most of the work has focused on the algorithmic lens, which I would argue is the tip of the iceberg, right? And there's a lot that's there to be explored, which is the human lens. And I'd also go ahead and argue that that's probably something that should receive equal importance, if not more, right? Now to do that, let us let me just walk you through a couple of quick examples around the interactional role that humans can play in advancing that understanding as well. How can we build systems that humans tend to interact with and understand and interact so they can benefit from them, right? What we looked at, so we've often thought about building new explanation methods, right? How many of us have actually thought about how can these explanation methods be delivered to the human, right? That's probably just as important. Should it be a text-based explanation? Should it be a graphical explanation? Should it be an audio explanation? What are the modalities? How exactly do those impact uh, the end users? Again, long story short, in one of our controlled experiments, what we found was for a given decision-making context, we looked at credibility assessment as this complex task, right? Misinformation, a lot of us are interested in that space. How exactly do you know that a tweet is credible? Uh, how exactly do you know a new story is credible? It's a difficult task, right? And we, uh, there are lots of systems that are being built to help people on that front. And that's the setting we explored. And we found that explanations in general have a significantly positive effect on user accuracy, right? If a user is trying to rely on a system to try and identify whether or not a particular tweet is credible or a new story is credible, turns out explanations are quite helpful. Well, that's understandable, not something that's mind blowing, right, at this point. We also found that text and audio explanations are apparently more effective in increasing the user accuracy than graphical explanations. But if you were to use graphical explanations, and we see the use of graphical explanations in a wide range of contexts, right? Without truly understanding how they trade off with alternatives. And we found that when you're using graphical explanations and people in the information visualization communities will nod their heads rigorously because of the fact that people, there are lots of individual differences between people, right? Some of us are better when it comes to our numeracy levels. We're just good at processing numbers. Some of us are better at understanding visualizations and inferring them correctly. But there's a broad variance in uh, those traits, right? So it turns out graphic explanations are significantly better off from being combined with textual and audio explanations as, uh, as opposed to being standalone ones. And to quickly remind you the context of why we need to think about these things, what is the real purpose of explainable AI? What's the envelope that's being pushed on that front? Well, one of the reasons is you wanna try and propagate appropriate reliance of users on AI systems, right? You don't, want to, you don't want them to over trust the system. You don't want them to under trust the system. Now to give you a quick example that can tell you what this appropriate reliance actually is. Imagine I'm driving my car and I'm, I've been driving this car and relying on my GPS system, which you can think of as being a sophisticated AI system that's relying on real-time data from all kinds of different sources. And I've been using it in my city for a long time, right? And it's been very reliable. Each time it said, hey, take this alternative route, it was correct. I avoided traffic. I got to my destination faster. Now imagine all of a sudden I go from this big city where I've used it and built all of my trust, and I go into a smaller town, right? Where maybe the maps aren't all that great. The real-time data isn't all that real, right? And it tells me to take a specific route that has lately you know, been blocked and I'm stuck in the middle of nowhere, right? That's quite realistic. But the fact that you've built trust in the system has allowed you to blindly assume that it would be just as reliable in this different context, right? This happens to us all the time. We probably don't notice it, it happens to us all the time. So over-reliance would mean I'd get stuck in this you know, no-go zone. Under-reliance would mean I would fail to benefit from all the advantages that I was doing in the city. Right? Imagine that I'd probably just be stuck in traffic all day long because I didn't choose to follow this alternative route. Right? So you, what you want to do, and that's the very difficult part. We saw DJ a couple of days ago reflect on some of these similar challenges. You want to orchestrate and facilitate appropriate reliance on AI systems. Build these complementary means and interactions that allow you to get there. And our proposition here is we could try and tap into analogies as an 
an instrument that will allow you to do just that, right? Now, imagine the context of lay people interacting with AI systems. Now, if you're an expert and you have a certain amount of expertise in this area, then you're probably okay with a, coming up with some amount of rational reasoning around why you need to do something or something else, right? But as a lay person, you probably don't have this at your disposal. So how exactly can you use analogies, which is essentially a structural mapping of a target domain on that you want to clarify onto a domain that a user is familiar with, right? We as educators do this all the time. We as conversationalists do this all the time, right? You've probably used analogies without consciously being aware of it to explain something that you know the other person is familiar with, right? That's essentially what an analogy is. How can we use analogies to try and you know, change the way in which explanations are being delivered? Because right now with single shot explanations, you have an explanation and you're saying, hey, good luck with that. Try and work with it in the way you please. Right? So what we uh, did recently was we came up with a way to try and understand how analogies can be effective. But the first real challenging thing is how can you even tell me what's a good analogy, right? Give, let me give you an example of the potential uh, that analogies can basically uh, create for us. So here is an input sample, and you have a bunch of concept level explanations, right? So you have uh, explanation along the lines of, well, with Kribi from and fused glands in the needle core biopsy from the prostate, this particular uh, patient has been diagnosed with having the adenocarcinoma of the prostate, right? Now imagine this is the explanation that's being delivered to an end user. Uh, Right, there, there are different contexts in which this can happen. So, you know, don't get blindsided by me trying to say that this is how the doctor would explain it to the patient. That's not what I'm saying. But there are other contexts in which lay people might need to consume explanations like this, which, you know, if you're not a medical doctor, this is all kinds of Greek and Latin, right? So, although there's an explanation, it's probably not all that helpful. So, how can I use an analogy here to not necessarily explain what creepy form infused glands are, but to help? lay people who lack the understanding of making heads and tails out of this figure out what exactly this even means, right? So by plugging in an analogy here, you see that previous form infused glands and needle core biopsy is definitely a sign of prostate cancer. This is like recognizing a unicorn due to the horn in its head, right? So you're sort of attributing this notion of how certain this outcome is, right? Which is hard to do sometimes depending on individual differences, expertise, all of that. So let me walk you through that with another analogy, since we're talking about that. Imagine you have experts who can, well, jump onto a boat or a ship, and they know how to sail it, they know how to ride it. They can cross this river by means of the expertise they have through the aid of that concept level explanation and end up in this goal, which is being able to appropriately rely on the AI system. But non-experts and lay people perhaps lack this common sense knowledge. They don't really have that ship to help them get them across that river, right? All they have are a pair of shoes, but you, you still have to cross that river. So what can you do? Well, you can build a bridge across that river, that river that common sense uh, knowledge can provide metaphorically that can help these people still cross the bridge, right? And this instrument is analogical inference. And that's essentially what we're trying to uh, play for, right? Now, appropriate reliance on AI can also be interpreted and studied in a lot of different ways. How exactly do individual single interactions with AI systems differ from multiple interactions, right? So that's something we've explored in the recent past. We've also, uh, so this was the example I was giving you about how exactly uh, reliance and trust can manifest and propagate. And one of the under important underpinnings here is how do you operationalize trust? Right, and, and there are lots of other things to study in this space, things like anthropomorphism. What are the metaphors you're using to uh, say this is an AI system? Because that can shape downstream expectations and how uh, exactly the uh, trust and reliance can be mediated. We've been exploring how conversational systems can play a role in trust formation. And uh, yeah, just to wind up, I'd like to say a lot of this work was done with a bunch of amazing uh, people who've supported in different ways. PhD students, postdoctoral researchers, and colleagues at the university and abroad. I'd also like to shamelessly plug in the fact that we are also hiring. So we have a very interesting PhD position that uh, we're trying to fill in the space of human AI decision making in the domain of healthcare, mental health, and well-being. And uh, I'll end this with 
the statement that cloud computing offers a promising means to overcome some of the fundamental challenges that we're facing today in both computation and interaction. And this can potentially herald a new and next generation of human-centered AI systems. I hope to have made that point and I'll be happy to take some questions now. Thank you. Thank you, Ajal. It was an excellent talk. So uh, time for one or two questions. See there. Yeah. Uh, hi. Uh, here. Hi. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, really interesting talk. Um, I had just one question. So you're adding analogies for the concept level explanations that the AI is providing. Correct. But um, how do you guarantee that if the AI is not making the correct prediction, mm -hmm. let's say if the AI is making some unfair yes. prediction, um, how do we ensure that the analogy that it's providing it's has that room for uncertainty or like how do we bridge that gap? Excellent point. So that's a brilliant point, right? So we, we're saying, hey, let's use analogies to try and explain an outcome, right? And we're saying we're building this on top of existing concept level explanations. So the valuable point that our, um, the gentleman here makes is what if the concept level explanation itself is ill-formed, right? So what you're doing is now you're propagating an ill-formed explanation and sort of making that clearer for the human. So there's a danger in that, right? That's spot on. And right now we're at the level of using analogies on top of concept level explanation. So the assumption is that you already have a step there that ensures you have the right concept level explanation. So the right reasons for the right classification, right? But that's a good point. That's something that we, we could potentially think about, but it's something that also comes at a step a little bit before uh, the point at which you can use analogies. But great, great uh, point there. Yeah, hi, uh, wonderful talk. Thanks. Um, so I had, I had a question on uh, regarding your kitchen example uh, that you use for the explainable AI uh, Right, so uh, I'm just wondering. Uh, so once you gather the feedback from from humans, uh, how do you encode this back into the training procedure? Um, yeah. in, in this, yeah, excellent point again. So there are a number of ways in which you could potentially do this. So, <laughs> excuse me. So in this particular work, which you know I can totally recommend and refer you to, what we did was we tried to uh, impart this understanding back into the feature space through and and did a whole lot of feature partitioning. Right, uh, I dive into some of the mechanics a little deeper. But that's essentially what we do. So you can essentially feed, uh, create a feedback loop that would help you repartition the uh, classes. That's that's the logic in there, right? And then we operationalize that. Yeah, maybe we can take one more question. So I have one. Yes. So yeah, yeah, fant fantastic talk again. So. Uh, you, you were talking about the uh, games with a purpose, right? Right. So, and we know that uh, ConceptNet also started with open mind, common sense games and all yes. that. So how do you, like, how do you think that, you know, whether these type of, uh, you know, games, what are their, what are their shortcomings, right? Uh, what, what was the mm -hmm. add-on on top of what you did, what we knew, knew from the open mind, common sense, which yeah. was, uh, which uh, eluded these concepts from uh, that game itself, yeah. Sure. Yeah. So indeed, you know, we're not the first ones to think about uh, common sense knowledge and how it's important to elicit all of this. I think uh, there are existing, you know, efforts in academia, especially ConceptNet being one of them. But one of the stark differences is we're entirely obsessed, rather, with the goal of trying to get and elicit tacit knowledge. And this is something that efforts like ConceptNet don't particularly gear towards, right? So if you if you look at most of the common sense knowledge that exists in efforts like ConceptNet, you'll find that, oh, a bottle has a bottle cap, a coffee mug has a handle, a door has a doorknob, right? Things like that, which are generative knowledge. That's how we call them. So if you, uh, I can also refer you to this paper because we make a very nice classification of the different types of common sense knowledge. And that's essentially the distinguishing factor, right? We are capable of getting more tacit knowledge, which is harder to articulate as opposed to other initiatives that exist right now. But there's a fair bit of overlap in me. Yeah. Thanks for the question. Any other quick questions? No? Nila? Sure. The general topic of science communication. Yes. So how science will be communicated to the common mass? Yeah. Indeed, yeah. 
So yeah, I guess this is more of a comment, a conversation to be had. So uh, last evening, Nilo and I were chatting about similar things and he spoke about how in part, one of the responsible things that we could do as we try to propagate a better understanding of AI systems and how they should be used is communicate science properly, right? So communication science itself is a field of research where people try to break down how exactly you can operationalize understandings and insights in a way that's consumable to the average lay person, right? And I think there's a fair bit of overlap between, you know, uh, why the motivation behind both these fields, explainable AI, especially when it's geared towards the layperson and communication science and what we've known in that space. There have been uh, singled out individual works in specific contexts. I was talking about this last evening where uh, in the past, Dan Goldstein and colleagues from Microsoft came up with this way of making new stories more consumable by the average audience, right? So, and, and even there they use, uh, I won't say analogies per se, but attributions that are more uh, relatable to the average audience. Example, imagine a new story that says 5,000 people got killed because of a flood in place X, right? And now for someone who's catching this new story elsewhere in another city, you probably don't have a nice grip around what exactly 5,000 people means, right? Oh, 5,000 people got killed. Hmm, okay. And then you move on to the next one. But imagine if you could create an attribution of what exactly this 5,000 people means, right? Now, what if I said this is 5,000 people got killed, and this is one third of the number of students who go to IIT Gandhinagar, right? Now you know, oh man, that's a lot, right? So that's the sort of understanding that you can propagate through simple tricks uh, that you know, people have been exploring and science communication is indeed one of those uh, important ways in which you could do that. But because of the fact that explainable AI is like so concretely positioned in different domains, I think it's only one part of it, right? One part of it is communicating science, the other part of it, how is truly understanding what needs to be explained when and how and why and how you can get there in a meaningful fashion that works, if not across uh, all kinds of domains in a well-defined context, but works really well, right? Thank you, Ujjal, for once again for everything that's important. Thank and you so much. I have a smile and for you from the organizers. Thank you so much. Thank you, Emily. Thank you so much. Oh, yeah. So we have our last talk uh, by Shoikot, Shoikot Mukherjee from uh, Hewlett Packard. So uh, the talk is titled Decentralized and Confidential Model Building from distributed data. So uh, uh, Shoikot uh, is an expert technologist uh, at Hewlett Packard, and uh, he has 18 years of uh, industry experience and uh, does research at the intersection of networking, storage, and AI. And presently, he's taking a lot of interest in uh, federated learning and federated workflow. So let's listen from Shoikot. Hello. Hello, Are you able to hear me? Is it audible? Hello, Are you able to hear me? Yeah. Okay, thanks. So hi, so I'm Shoikat Mukherjee. I work in Hewlett Packard and Enterprise. And my topic today is decentralized and confidential model building from distributed data. So my talk will be in two parts. Okay, first we'll talk about the technology and then we'll talk about an experiment or the use case that we have studied there. So what is decentralized model building? So it's a way of building model where multiple parties come together and they build a collaborative or they train a model jointly. Okay. And the second point is that it is built from the distributed data. And third is that there is no central authority to build a model. So why we need decentralized model building, right? So before going to the decentralized model building need, okay, so let's see that what are the model building evolutions currently we are having, okay? And let's start with an example. So let's say there are four hospitals, one, two, three, and four, 
and they have collected their data and the data resides in their data center and they are trying to build a model out of it okay so four hospitals will build a model separately and uh, the data will be in isolation and there is no sharing of the data so from the individual data they will build the model and the model that will be built will be obviously suboptimal and biased because each model i mean none of the model has seen the complete set of data right now there is another way of building the model it's called the centralized model building right so where uh, data there is a cloud or the central aggregator and data is actually transferred to the cloud and there it got aggregated and then we build a model inside the cloud and then the model is transferred to the individual locations for inference right so this in this case the uh, the performance wise uh, this is by far the best way to build a model because model will be able to see the complete set of data right but it has many challenges so first is the data gravity right so it's very difficult to data has gravity and it's very difficult to move the data from one location to another and then uh, if you move then there will be duplication of data at the edge as well as the cloud and then it has the data ownership challenges once you share the data then data is not owned by you anymore and then it has the privacy challenges and various regulations like gdpr and hipaa because of those things you cannot move the data actually so now the third way of building the model that is called the federated model building right so here we train the model locally on the individual hospitals and we share the insights in the central aggregator or the cloud so data is not shared here only the insights or the learned parameters are shared they merged inside the cloud and then again the merged parameter is sent back to the uh, individual hospitals and they it's a kind of iterative training so they again try to train from that uh, merged parameter right so it's a kind of continuous iterative training now this is comparatively cool right because you are not sharing the data you are sharing only the parameters or the insights and uh, so those kind of restrictions are not coming here right but still it has a problem what is the problem problem is the this third party cloud or the central entity that decides right so uh, so this is the federated learning and we have the central or the cloud or the central aggregator there now let's understand the problem okay in it, in more deeper way so first is the central controller of the trend see if this is not a uh, individual or localized model building right so it's a multi party model building and it's a iterative way of building the model so somebody has to control the training somebody has to manage the training so uh, who and here who is managing the training it is the cloud or the central aggregator right second problem is the central custodian of the model now the local model is built on the individual locations or individual hospitals right but the global model is built or the aggregation is done at the cloud level so and this 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 become i mean the cloud becomes the central aggregation point of the model right so it is the central custodian of the model and tomorrow like the twitter if they ask you to pay 8 dollar for the blue dot or 8 dollar for the model then you have to pay for that now third third point is the this cloud or the central entity is the third party it does not have the data it does not provide any compute because training is done on locally individual node individual hospitals yet it is the most powerful entity of the total ecosystem because it is it is the controlling the training and it is controlling it is having the central cost i mean it is having this global model right so apart from this uh, like this kind of uh, this kind of uh, system actually does not go well with the many regulated domains like uh, healthcare or the financial industries because not only the data they don't even want to share the insights also to a third party and then obviously it's a single point of failure so the question to the tech community is that can we extend the concept of the federated learning so the concept is very cool can we can extend the concept of the federated learning to build a global model 
without any central entity. So what essentially we want is that we don't want the central entity and we want that individual hospitals can talk to each other and build a global model out of it, right? And the answer is yes, we can do this using the decentralized machine learning. So if you see the central aggregator, okay, earlier that was there in the federated learning, what it was doing, first thing is that it was having a central control plane, right? So what we can do, we can, uh, we can replace this central control plane with a blockchain-based decentralized control plane where all the parties will have the same stake. So that is the first thing we have solved. And the second thing is that it is, the, it is merging the parameters, right? So we can, uh, one of the parties can take the ownership of merging and the next cycle, another party can take the ownership for the margin, right? So in that case, we don't need any central entity. So this is this way, if you build the model, so we have, uh, we have named this way of building the model as a swarm learning, okay? So let's understand the concept, okay? So we have the blockchain-based uh, decentralized uh, control plane, and we have the ML and data plane. So that is there. So the total five entities are there. Okay. They want to build a decentralized model. So another thing is that from now, now onwards, whenever I'm telling swarm learning, so it will be nothing but the decentralized machine learning. Okay. So, uh, and another two terms I will introduce. If you see the blockchain network, we have the there we have the SWARM network nodes. So SWARM network nodes is the nodes are the nodes that form the box blockchain network. So similarly, if I tell the SWARM learning node, so it is the, nothing but the ML and the data nodes, the nodes that have the data and the compute power for localized training. Okay. So now understand the concept here. Okay. So let's say that this first step, what happened now, these ACL nodes actually re registered the data and the ML node registered to the blockchain network and they receive the ML model to train globally. In the second phase, so they train the model locally and when uh, the, after some batches of training, when the parameter has to be merged, so that time they shared the parameters. So they actually published the parameters and in the third phase, they shared the parameter to one of the parties there and the parameter got merged by the parties and they again send back to the individual note for the retraining. In the next step, so again, the local training happens. Now this time they send the parameter to the other nodes who takes the ownership of the merging and then it got merged there. And then uh, again, the parameter are sent back. So this way the training continues. So here both uh, control plane and the data plane, nobody owns actually. So uh, quickly, I'll go through the architecture. Okay. So it is the, uh, we have the control plane, we have the blockchain, and then we have the SOM network node. So we have our business logic written. It's not a plane, vanilla blockchain. We have the business logic written over it. And then we have the email and the data plane, and we have the uh, machine learning platform like Keras or PyTorch. And then we have the, uh, like our libraries are there that you can import and call the APIs. So. And then, the data ML and data node, actually we have the REST APIs to communicate with the SN node. SN node actually is the control plane in our case. So we have multiple of the control planes and that actually builds the decentralized control plane in our case. Similarly, we have the multiple of the data nodes that will bring, I mean, that will uh, build the decentralized data plane, okay? And the parameter sharing is done using the MTLS or the HTTPS protocol okay, among the nodes. And so this way we'll be able to build a model in a completely decentralized way. Okay. And if you want to see this architecture in a scale, then it will be look like this. So there will be, let's say organization one, two, three, fours are there. And the inner circle that you are seeing is a control plane. And the outer circle that you are seeing will be the data plane.
so little uh, we'll go to little deep on the uh, both the two planes okay so the control plane we have it is having the blockchain and we are using ethereum so go ethereum we are using and then web 3.py is the communication using web 3.py where it's communicating with the blockchain and it's not a public blockchain it's a private permission blockchain so i mean it's not like that anyone can join in the blockchain and then it the blockchain maintains the distributed data distributed global state of the system okay and uh, I mean, if you talk about the states, then we are having the member information, different training state, and then we have the epoch, what is the current weightage, all those things. And another two point is the orderly execution of the global state change and the consistency. So those two things are maintained by the blockchain and the smart contract inside the blockchain. And we have the rest APIs also. And on the ML and data plane, uh, we, are, we support Keras and PyTorch. And then we have the, uh, I mean, you can use uh, Swarm Learning libraries there. You can import the libraries. And then, so though the control pen is still there on the, uh, on the blockchain side, but the heavy lifting or the main work is done by the ML and the data plane. And it actually initiate the trade states transitions, the local training, the parameter sharing, all this are done by the ML and the data plane. So on the uh, algorithm side, if you see, so in the left side, these are the, uh, I think these are the member one, two, and three, right? And then initially they will do the local training. And after some batches of the training, they will publish the parameter. And these are then with the published parameter, we'll do a weighted merge, and then we'll create a merge parameter. And that will again go to the member members for the retraining. And uh, here, if, if you take any member N, okay, so the, uh, th this is the regular training. So what you do in the regular training is that you loop through the epochs, right? And then you split the data set and into the batches, and then you loop through the each batches, and then you do the local training, right? Now here, if you want to add swarm learning, Okay, decentralized machine learning capability in the model. So what we need to do is that you just check that whether that particular batch falls under the swarm boundary or not. What is S? S is nothing but the swarm boundary. That is the sync frequency of the batches. So if that batch falls under the swarm boundary, then you publish the parameter, see that whether you are a leader or not. And if you are a leader, then you retrieve the parameter from the, all the members, do a global training or the merging, and if you are a member, then you just wait for the margin and then you get and load the margin parameters. And then again, you continue to the next batch training. So, I mean, this is cool, right? Behind this, all the heavy lifting is done. Okay, we have the control panel communication and all those things, but even this can be further be simplified. Okay, so what we can do is that what we have done is that, uh, so how you can convert a ML program to a decentralized ML program, okay? So you can just import the swarm callback here that you are seeing, okay? Just instantiate the swarm callback with a sync frequency and the minimum pair. Sync frequency is the, after how many batches the sync will happen, and then minimum peers is the number of peers you need for the global training. And then you add that callback, to your training class. So your localized model building will become a swarmified or will become a decentralized model. You have the capability of building model decentralized. Okay, so this is the technology, okay. Now using this technology, we, uh, we have done some experiments and then, uh, uh, so it's a better disease classification using swarm learning. You will see how we have done, okay. So it is a joint study by DZNE and HP. DZNE is a, is a German-based uh, medical research organization. And uh, the paper was published in Nature last year. So what is the objective of the study? It is that to build a binary disease classifier from distributed data using the swarm learning. And we have three diseases we have targeted, AML, which is a kind of blood cancer, and TB and COVID. So uh, the, uh, the next three points, data set, 
model and the distributions okay all these three are provided by the dzme so they have collected the data set from gene expression omnibus and that uh, they kind of uh, deprocessed it and uh, they they already experimented with that data set okay so they have the model ready so model in the sense that the model architecture they have shared with us and that is a 10 layer neural network model and then the distributions on the distribution side they have created uh, various iids and non iids distributions among three to six nodes and we wanted to learn swarm over it okay and the data set if you see so this is the uh, data set which is, it's a high dimensional data set which contains the gene expressions which has the samples and various gene expressions value and the last it's a label is the control or guess whether it's a disease or not a disease so let's understand the data set a little bit because that will uh, that will be interesting okay so when your body faces a medical condition what will happen the cell will respond right as part of the cell's response it will generate the coded information and that coded information will build proteins okay now this process is called the gene expression and if you see here this is a cell and i mean this is a cell and these are the nucleus okay now when there is a i mean cell decides that i need to create protein so the dna actually dna transcription happens and it creates mrna and this mrna again using the process of translation create the protein now this this mrna is nothing but the generated coded information so when you are saying that generated coded information is nothing but the mrna and there will be multiple of mrnas and we i mean in a cell if you take all the mrnas we call it transcriptome so so all the mrnas in a cell call the transcriptome okay so this is the knowledge okay now you see so what is the idea here so find out the cells response and map it to a disease so if the body has a disease so your relevant cell will respond so if you know what are the cells response then you can map it to a disease okay but how 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 we know that what is the cells response right so there are two ways to know it first is that you generate so you analyze this generated coded information which is nothing but the transcriptome which means that you have to do a transcriptome analysis or otherwise you uh, take the protein and characterize the protein and it has been seen that transcriptome analysis has a better result okay so we do transcriptome analysis here okay so you need to study the transcriptome and there are techniques to study it okay using the microarray or rna sequencing and it measures the gene expressions okay so for the tb and covid we have taken the whole blood transcriptome i mean the relevant cells are blood and then for the aml we have taken the pbmc transcriptome that is a special immune cell okay and this is the experiment setup okay so we have three nodes that you are seeing one two and three and they have created different biased and non biased distributions among the three node okay so the thing is that so every node will build the model individually with their local data okay and then we'll run swarm learning over the three nodes and we'll be having the fourth model so total four model will be there individual three model and then we have the swarm model that will be run through one two and three okay so these four model will be compared against the same test data set and we'll see what is the result okay. so this is the test setup okay and all i mean each scenario actually we have run 100 times and we have taken the average of the result and then we compared okay this is the kind of restriction that they have put so uh, so we'll see that how they have created different kind of biases in the data set among the nodes okay so it is the context biasing okay so you see here that uh, so before that what is studies studies is a collection of sample with some similarities you can say similarity in the sense that let's say that those uh, those samples are collected from the same branch of a hospital okay so uh, there might be the demography related similarities or there might be some uh, instrument related similarities okay so there are multiple of studies so they have divided the studies into three i mean in three sets and given to node one node two and node three and then from the node one they are divided into 80 percent samples they have divided 80 percent trend and 80 percent test so you can see that here the 
uh, there is a overlapping in the studies in the train and test set okay when you are doing now this test actually we have combined these three tests and create a uber test set and then we have compared all the models here so one two three models and the swarm learning model total four models and this is the result that swarm is giving around 98 percent accuracy whereas the best node or the best model best individual model actually giving 94 and the worst is also 94. so what is the observation here is that swarm is providing a better model and also if you see this is a box with the plot so if you see here swarm is able to provide more consolidated result so this is node one node two and node three and this is swarm so its matrix spread is much lesser now come to the second so they have created more restrictive cross study okay so here they have divided the studies into 25 percent they have given to node one node two and node three for training and the remaining 25 percent they have they are having for the testing so there is no overlapping between the train and test studies study level there is no overlapping okay so now uh, if you see the performance the uh, swarm is 95 percent and best is 92 and worst is 91 in the accuracy okay and uh, so uh, so if you observe from the earlier okay so the uh, the performance is little bit reduced because it is a restrictive study okay so uh, it was 94 from 94 now it become 92 swarm also reduced so what is the uh, kind of understanding is that so swarm is still able to provide better model and so it depends on the local model also so if your local model starts giving poor performance then uh, even swarm model may not help you okay so you have to increase you have to increase your performance of the local model and then you do the whatever the hyperparameter and those things hyperparameter optimization of those things so that you can do to increase the swarm level performance now third thing is that uh, this this is another interesting so they have volume and category based biasing so in the distributions they have uh, it's a volume if you see that so they have mixed all the studies okay and they have created 8% volume 48% and 24% three volumes and even on the uh, category they are the case control uh, distribution if you see there is 1 is to 1 1 is to 99 and 7 is to 3 they have okay and then uh, here swarm is able to provide 98 percent performance best model is 97 and worst is 54 percent okay now if you see here that swarm is still able to produce better model in the accuracy and it is able to remove the bias okay because worst model here 54 only now the fourth example is the now we have increased the isolation okay so it is uh, it is not three nodes now it is now six nodes and it's a equal distributions okay so equal distribution in terms of volume as well as the category okay and then uh, we have compared the output so it is uh, swarm accuracy if you see here that we have taken all the matrices okay accuracy sensitivity and the specific specificity and swarm performs better in all all of the matrices and this actually so if you see the what is the understanding or the learning here is the better in all matrices and it's even it is able to perform with the increased isolations the last one is that we have tried to create a covid outbreak scenario okay so what we have done is that so here if you see this is the outbreak node which is having a one is to five person one is to five uh, ratio on the case and control okay now this is the early secondary which is having one is to ten and this is the later secondary which is having one is to twenty case control distributions and then if you see the test cases we have a uh, different test cases with varying prevalence of the case and control okay it's one is to one one is to two and one is to ten so I'm not, I'm not showing the other two, I'm showing just this result here, okay. So here, if you see that the performance wise, the swarm is uh, accuracy, if you see swarm is 97%, where best is 96 and worst is 90. But another thing you uh, need to see is that it is the sensitivity, though I have not listed here. So if you see the sensitivity wise, this is the node one, 
is actually i think close to 1% better than the swam okay so what is the understanding here is that so swam is generally better in the balance metric because if you see what we are doing in the parameter merging is we are just doing a weighted average right so what we have seen is that generally swam is always better in the balance metric like accuracy or roc uc curve if you take but if you take a kind of uh, kind of not biased metrics like sensitivity or something then it really depends on the how your distribution is and how what is the data set you are using how your distribution is and then you need to do kind of hyperparameter optimization and those things to increase this performance okay so this is the thing and i think yeah so i'm done so if you have any questions you can ask me <laughs> I'm well within time, right? Yeah, you are well within time. So, questions? Yeah. Hello. Thank you, sir, for the presentation. Yeah. Uh, sir, in the slide number. Okay. So, yeah. So, good question. So, leader can be selected in different ways. Okay. So, the ways can be, it can be a round robin fashion. You can select the leader. Otherwise, you can select the leader. Let's say whoever first tells the control pin that, okay, I'm done. I'm ready for merging. So, you can select that. A node to be the leader okay or you can do a kind of voting among the nodes and select a leader no it will be shared with the all the nodes yes yeah any other questions um uh, thank you for the great talk so the question I had is that uh, there was this uh, statement in the algorithm that until a desired accuracy is reached, so that process is repeated at this one. Yeah. So <clears throat> am I audible? Yeah. Okay. So the process is repeated till the desired accuracy is reached. So is this desired accuracy like the aggregation of all the organization, I mean, the <clears throat> organization specific models, whichever are reaching and it is being tested on the common test set, probably the aggregation of the test data. So is it that desired accuracy, which is being tested? Because I mean, it may be so that a particular model of an organization has reached that particular desired accuracy, but uh, I mean, I get, I mean, the aggregation may have reached, but it possibly the other organizations may have not reached that desired accuracy, but the average may have reached that level. So, has... yeah. so see, there are two ways uh, to handle it. Okay. One is that, uh, so either you can go with the epoch. So let's say you decide that, okay, hundred epochs I will execute. Okay. So all the nodes will execute the hundred epochs or otherwise you can go with the desired accuracy. <laughs> So now in the, so some of the things that were not told here is that, see, these are the hospitals when they come together to uh, kind of decide for a um, decentralized machine learning. So they generally, uh, they generally has a consortium kind of thing. Okay. They form a consortium and they kind of decide that find out the data set and kind of decide that, okay, this will be the desired accuracy level or we will target this kind of accuracy. Okay. And it's a kind of iterative process. So any machine learning, you cannot tell that I will be having this. Okay. So you need to do the iteration and find out and increase the performance. Let's say if earlier you have seen this is the performance or this is the accuracy level. Try to improve the accuracy level with the more hyperparameter optimizations or those things. Okay. So it's a, a kind of learning depending on the data set and the distributions you are having. You need to find out what is the uh, desired accuracy level and you need to improve that. 
So it's not a one step process that you have to do. It's correct. Yeah, there was a question. Uh, yeah, please go ahead. So, sir, why after using the units, the swarm you receive also freezed? I didn't hear that. Sorry. Am I audible, sir? Yeah. Uh, so, why after increasing the number of nodes, the swarm accuracy got decreased? Swarm accuracy got decreased. There was an eighty-seven percent. No. So. Okay. So it was not decreased. So if you see that was done in a different data set. So it was a TB data set that was done. Also, sir. Uh, I'll show you. Testing done. Is the testing done on the master node? Sorry? Is the testing is done on the master node? Master node. What is the master node? Collects the data uh, model from other clients. So see, there is no master node here. So in each cycle, one node can be leader and it is it can do so that. Leader activity. nodes. Yeah. Is so, the testing done on the leader node? No. So, okay. So first, first question is that this is the, uh, so this is your talking, right? Yes, that yes. distribution. So this is a different test. So you can see here, there is a TB data set. So you cannot compare earlier is the AML. And the second is that you are asking that whether this testing is done on the master node or not, right? No. So what we do is that before starting the training and after the end of the training, we it's a part of the system that we do a swarm merge, which means that when you are starting the training, all the nodes will be starting from the same point. And when you are ending the training, all the nodes will end at the same point. So since there is no master node kind of concept here, so all the nodes at the end of the training will have the same swarm model. So you can take any node, and so you I can detail that this is the swarm model. I meant leader node. Sorry? Leader node, I mean. Yeah. So what I'm telling is that you can take any node and then that is the swarm model. So there is no leader node kind of concept. Okay. So uh, we had a question. Why you have uh, very less number of nodes, uh, like three and six? Uh, I we have tested. See here, uh, we have tested with three, six. Okay, but in our case, I think we have tested maximum uh, thirty-two to sixty-four nodes also. Okay, okay thank you. Sir. But uh, so it is. So there is a difference. Okay, between the actual federated learning when the Google has come up with actual federated learning because there is that is more on the device centric FL. Okay, so where there will be multiple of billions of mobiles and these things. Here it is more addressing the enterprise use case where there will be hospitals or the financial institutions. So there won't be millions or billions of financial institutions. They will come together and do the joint training, right? So we uh, it's a it's a more uh, device. It's not a device centric. It's the enterprise centric. Okay, uh, sir, I have questions that uh, what if uh, if we increase the number of nodes? So how uh, the parameter settings will be handled? Let us say after each cycle, uh, the parameters has been uh, shared among the each and every local node. So how the scalability of parameter settings will be handled? I'm if, not able to get to. Okay. okay. So yeah, if we increase the number of nodes mm -hmm. uh, and in each cycle, the parameters are shared, local parameters are shared with each nodes. So if we increase the number of nodes, let us say from six to, uh, you can say 100 or 200. So how these parameter settings will be handled uh, if we increase the scalability of the model? So your question is that if we increase the number of nodes, then yes. how the parameters will be shared? Yes, because increasing the number of parameters, uh, you can say the nodes will also increase the parameters. Correct. So how this model will uh, manage uh, for these uh, parameter sharing? Yeah, so that's what I'm telling. So this is the enterprise use case. Don't compare it with the device use case where you will be having. So what is the expectation here? It will be having tens or twenties or thirties or not more than hundreds nodes coming together to do the decentralized training. Okay. Uh, Any other questions? Uh, yes, sir. Federated learning? Set up with a blockchain. 
uh, you can say, but see, uh, whenever you are telling federated learning, so it is not a centralized federated learning. It's a completely decentralized federated learning. There is no central authority here. Okay. So, uh, can we call it a uh, basically um, decentralized federated learning with blockchain? Basic, uh, like in federated, if we are having one or two servers and we are applying blockchain for a security exchange purpose between server and clients. So blockchain is here used only for the control plane. Okay. So whenever, like if you want to control the training, you have to control the training. Okay. So that all the control states are maintained in the blockchain and actual parameter sharings or the data sharing is done through the individual nodes or the ML nodes. So in that case, and so you can tell that, okay, it's a federated learning with a blockchain, uh, you can say. Thank you. <clears throat> Any other questions? Uh, yes. Uh, uh, hello, sir. Uh, here. Uh, okay. Thank you for the very insightful talk. Uh, so this uh, uh, distributed from learning is uh, good uh, while we are respecting uh, ownership of the data, privacy settings and all. And my question is uh, more related to uh, practicality perspective. So we are saying that every hospital need to have a capability in terms of training the model and uh, the expertise they need. Second thing is the uh, time related cost and resource related cost. The, so it, the training is happening in multiple iterations, right? So uh, the total cost involved will be much more, I feel, than uh, a centralized setting. Uh, so how you like uh, mitigate uh, uh, this sort of issues? Uh, uh, yeah. So first thing is that, see, I am, we are not comparing with the centralized setup because centralized setup is the, is the, um, the ideal setup for a model, performance model to build, okay? Because it has seen all the data. It will be able to see all the data at a shot. Now here, what happens is that when you are not able to share the data, so already you have put restrictions. You cannot share the data. Like you, you won't believe, like if you go to financial industries or the healthcare industries, they will not give the data, not even they want to share the insights. So it's a more on the business side that is coming from, okay? Now, if you have that problem, already you are restricting it, okay? So now uh, you don't have any other way to do it, right? Right, so I understood that. You are saying that there is no baseline to compare with any. Yeah, you people. cannot compare with the centralized. Okay, yeah, got it, sir. Thanks. So that, that is why in all the examples, uh, the comparison I have not done with the centralized. I have done with the individual model and then with the SOAM model. Got it, sir. Thanks. Yeah. So, sir, uh, you said that during training, after some batches, you are uh, aggregating all the hyperparameters in a leader node with a kind of weighted sum. So my question is, are the weights are fixed or it is like uh, updated during training? No, so if you are seeing that, uh, if you have seen that uh, our API, okay, so where you are uh, instantiating the uh, that uh, SWAM callback class. So there are two parameters, right? So those two parameters are the mandatory, the number of peers you need and what is the SWAM batch, SWAM level batch size. Now, apart from that, there are many others uh, non-mandatory parameter that is there. So one of the parameter is the node weightage. So while training, you can specify the node weightage. Okay, this node will have this kind of weightage. So that can come from your domain knowledge or whoever is executing the training. So he can find out that, okay, this node might have more data or this node might have more quality data. So I want to put more weightage on that node. So that you can do. Thanks. So that's the last one I'm going to take. Hello, Emma. So thank you for the great talk. Uh, I just had a question that uh, you said that uh, medical, especially medical and financial organizations, they are not willing to share the data as well as the insights. So in this case, like uh, uh, it was said that uh, in one iteration, uh, once the local model is trained, the insights are then uh, sent over the network to a specific node. So, like, how is that? Uh, is that okay to them? That's my question, basically. What is that? Like, yeah. uh, let's say there are four hospitals and they train four AI models locally, and then uh, over here, since there is no centralized server, so all the uh, the parameters which we get four different sets of parameters they are sent over the network to a one node in the blockchain network right so like uh, is that uh, network data sharing or uh, insight sharing is allowed is that okay to them yeah insight so you are asking that whether the insight sharing is allowed or not yeah like 
initially you said that uh, they don't want to share the insights also yeah so they are sharing the insights with the individual hospitals right okay so they are not sharing the insights with the third party so see four hospitals are building a model now whenever you are telling that okay i am third party i will i will uh, you give me the insights i will build the model so they don't know about the third party they don't they don't want to share the data with the third party not the not only the data not even the insight with the third party but let's say there are four branches in the hospitals and they want come together and do a joint kind of mo collaborative model building so they can share the insights with them it's the insights not the data okay okay Thank yes you. that's fine and if you want to see i mean see this is the public github okay for hp swarm learning so you can go and you can see and it's available there you can go download and test thanks again shrikot for the very interesting talk so on behalf of the organizers i have a small memento for you So before I go for the vote of thanks, I think Pavan has a small announcement about the certificate. Okay, Abhilasha around. Okay, so yesterday in the banquet, we announced the winners for the poster session. And I think Abhilasha had left the banquet by that time. So using this opportunity to again uh, congratulate. congratulate her. So Abhilasha for the first prize on, on her uh, poster deep extreme mixture models for time series forecasting. Abhilasha. Okay, so I guess like we have come to the end of a very fantastic event. So I personally have learned a lot of things from this event. Uh, all the talks were like fascinating. Uh, I got to know so many uh, interesting directions of research. I got to talk with people and I am uh, also like uh, in touch with few of them starting new collaborations uh, okay so uh, all in all it was a fantastic feeling for me and this could have been possible for a lot of key players uh, who took part in making this event uh, successful so first of all the organizers uh, and especially the local organizers sitting in the front bench, smiling and doing all the hard works for us, like starting from uh, arranging the guest house, the cars at time, uh, scheduling the talks. I mean, everything like was kind of pitch, picture perfect. So yeah, I, in fact, I was trying to think like, could an event be so perfect? Like, so we always have glitches here and there. So I, I did not feel anything as such. Maybe you can share your opinion and feedback. So, uh, yeah, so that's that's uh, a lot of, that takes a lot of effort. And I think we need to have a big round of applause for them. So again, like another important part of having this kind of, uh, uh, like a symposium is money. So, and the money comes mostly from uh, our benevolent sponsors. So one of our biggest sponsors was uh, ACM India. So they have uh, generously sponsored uh, the student, student travel grants, as well as uh, some of the, uh, uh, like the poster and the uh, data fund prizes. 
uh, then we had uh, a large number of companies like uh, who have come forward to help us uh, i'll just to for the sake of completion i'll just want to mention their names so that we get them on board next time also and many more like them so uh, we had Marilyn Mind, we had Hewlett Packard, we had Deep Mind, we had Accenture, we had Swiggy, we had Newtonix, we had NetWeb, we had Google, and we had Artificial Intelligence Journal sponsoring us for this event. So I think like without uh, the money in place, it would not have been as like as gorgeous as this. So again, a big round of applause for them. And last but not the least, the smoothness was like, uh, I mean, greatly a, a contributory part from all the active volunteers. May I request all the active volunteers to please come up on stage so that like we can give a big round of applause for all of you. So that's why I wanted you to be in the auditorium. Please come up on stage. May I also request all the organizers to please come up on stage so that we can have a group photo with the volunteers. So before we disperse for lunch, there are two announcements. The uh, first is that the participation certificates are ready at the registration desk. So all the participants are requested to collect their certificates from the registration desk during the lunch. And the second is that we hope to see all of you at IIT Bombay next year so uh, uh, iit bombay has generously accepted to host indoml 2023 and all of you are welcome back again thank you very much Thank you.